Hey everyone, and welcome to our thir 13th Free BSC Friday. I'm Deb Goodkin, and I'm the Executive Director of the Free BSC Foundation. So first, I would like to take a step back and thank everyone who's been watching our live talks as well as our recordings. This has been one of the ways the foundation has stepped in to help connect the community and hopefully engage new people in our community. But one thing I do want to do is, you know, we post all of these videos on our website, but we have so many other resources there too. And I want to highlight them because other individuals and organizations um, are also providing online content, whether it's videos, webinars, or blog posts. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen here and go here. And so what you'll see here, so if you go to our website and we'll post the URL too in the IRC chat window. And if you go here to FreeBSD project, and then we have FreeBSD resources, it will take you to this page. And so what we've tried to do is lay it out for like, um, you know, introduction guides at the top, how to guides on how to set up your own desktop and Minecraft server and all different types of, um, applications. And then as you go down here, you'll see that if you uh, want to run your own install fest or install FreeBSD on your own system, that we do have all the notes on um, how we've supported the install fest in the past. But going to the bottom, this is where we have what we're calling the community resources page. And so we have our own resources here, the FreeBSD Foundation. We also have FreeBSD Fridays listed down here. There's also the FreeBSD Projects office hours. But also there are um, other organizations and companies who are providing other content. And so for example, we just added Clara um, and Mort Systems and they're both providing, well, Clara is doing webinars on OpenCFS, which have been great. And Mort Systems have been writing up these um, phenomenal blogs on just, um, that are really detail oriented and, and they've been great to introduce you to different aspects of FreeBSD and computers. And then I do want to highlight one of my favorite YouTube stars, uh, Robo Nagi, I think that's how you pronounce it. And he does excellent uh, videos on FreeBSD and they're informative and clever and, um, and usually has a little bit of humor in there. And so it makes it really interesting to watch. So anyway, you're welcome to go there after and, and see what, um, you yeah, know, what we have there. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And um, so today our um, talk will be an introduction to Capsicum by Marius Zaborski. And uh, first, before I talk a little bit about him, I just want to mention that uh, if you have any questions during his talk, please post them in the IRC channel. And if you remember, please put a queue before it so we know that it's a question. So let me tell you a little bit about Marius. He's a QA and developer manager at Fudo Security. His main interests are operating system security and low level programming. And he's been a FreeBSD committer since 2015. At Fudo Security, Marius is developing a solution to monitor, record, and control traffic in an IT infrastructure, the best PAM solution in the world. Marius's main work in this project is focused, but not limited to creating infrastructure around Capsicum, a lightweight operating system capability and sandbox fr framework. In 2018, Marius organized the Polish BSD user group. In his free time, he enjoys blogging and will post his, the URL to his blog in the IRC chat. Recently, he's joined the FreeBSD Journal editorial board. Thanks, Marius, for that. So now I'll hand this off to Marius. Thank you, Deb. Good morning, everybody. Um, I will try now to share my screen with the presentation. So I hope everything works. So welcome everybody. Um, today I would like to tell you a little bit about Capsicum, which is a um, uh, security framework, a sandboxing framework in FreeBSD. Um, it's a little bit low level 
framework, uh, framework. so we will be uh, having some C code on the slides. Uh, I will try to describe them in detail, but if I will miss something or something will be um, misunderstood, then just write on the IRC and we will try to go back and, and uh, discuss the uh, code a little bit further. Um, I will tell you all, all about the weak and strong uh, sides of uh, Capsicum. Uh, and uh, about the ecosystem that we are building around the capsicum itself. Um, I hope after this uh, talk, you will be able to grab capsicum and apply it to your own programs or solutions. So why we really need, before we will start uh, discussing the capsicum, I would like to talk a little bit about the motivation behind sandboxing in general. So we have a lot, multiple different mitigations in operating systems like SLR and X uh, and so on and so on. But uh, in many cases, those mitigations are only making harder to attackers to exploit the program itself. Uh, we should think uh, a little bit more about the impacts of the uh, exploiting the application itself. So I would like to tell you a horror story uh, about a program which can do basically everything in your operating system. When it would be exploited, he can read your data, uh, he can read your uh, emails, your photos, send them over the internet and so on and so on. So, one of the programs that came in my mind, the smallest program in, in our operating systems, is basically CAT. So if somebody would find a bug in CAT, let's say buffer overflow or something like that, and he would be able to exploit uh, our instance of CAT, he would gain access to all our data. He would gain access as a normal user can. He could send all those files I mentioned before, uh, he could turn on the webcam or whatever he really wants to do. So there is a joke, very old joke from uh, XKCD, uh, which says that if somebody would steal my laptop when I'm logged in, they can read my emails, take my money, and so on and so on, but at least they cannot install our uh, drivers uh, on my computer. And the same goes for the process. If somebody would exploit our uh, program, he can do all of those things, uh, but at least he doesn't have our root permissions and can't do something malicious. Um, so when program can do all of those things, we are talking about the ambient authority. This, be, this term means that program can do whatever he wants. And we want to forbid it. We want to have some kind of isolation and some kind of control, what program really can do. For example, with the cat horror story, we would like to allow cat only to read our data. Cat doesn't really write anything. He doesn't connect to the um, internet and so on, so on. So we would like to have something that would make it less, um, have less permissions. So before we will jump into the capsicum itself, we would like to, I would like to show you other um, techniques for sandboxing. If you came from the Linux community, then you maybe know SecCom, which is a, a sandboxing technique uh, built in Linux operating system. So SecCom comes from secure computing with filters. It, is with us from 2005, so it's already 15 years. And um, there are two main uh, nodes in which SecComps is working. One is the strict mode, which out very, very limited uh, number of Cisco. This is like read, write, exit, and seek return. And nothing else can be done in this sandbox. This is very limiting. We can't really, um, fork, we can't open any file and so on, so on. So if 
we need something that only do some complicated computation, computations and only push the data from one, uh, one process to another, then we probably can use the strict mode. But in general, this is very limiting and this is something that uh, is not very often used. Uh, second, most of the time it's called SECCOM BPF. And this is because of the second um, mode in which SECCOM can work. It's called uh, uh, mode, uh, filter mode. Um, it's using a Berkeley packet filter and we can define filters on our syscalls, which um, syscalls can be uh, executed and which not. It's a very powerful tool to be honest, because we even can filter which arguments can be passed to those syscalls. Unfortunately, second BPF is very complicated. So the SSHD program, which limits, uh, which has some limitations with, with the SecComp. And if we will start reading the code, like, uh, for example, the STLO macro, we have BPF jump from BPF jump plus BPF JAQ and so on and so on. It's really horrible to write any uh, code here. And at the end, finally, we can do uh, STLO or STDeny to, uh, to give some access to the, to the syscall or not. It's very complicated. It's very hard to create good rules. Um, unfortunately, uh, there is a lib, uh, library built around SecCom which hides all of those um, logics from the user. So we can use SecCom init and add rules uh, and finally use SecCom load to, imp, uh, to install or to, to apply all those rules that we want to do. There are some uh, even with the leap seccoms, there are some um, problems with, with seccom in general. For example, if we would use different libc versions, one which is using open and second one open ed, then we have two different filters or rules that we have to uh, implement. Uh, other thing is uh, what if the API will change uh, in uh, kernel? So we also need to check during the compilation, for example, the version of Linux which will be run and adjust our filters in it. What about uh, our application? If it would be changed, we also need to adjust those uh, BPF rules. So this makes second BPF very hard to apply. There are only few applications that really use uh, second BPF. Uh, SSAT, I think, is one of the most popular ones. So what about the capsicum then? What is the difference between seccom and uh, capsicum? So we sec, uh, the, the um, seccom BPF or seccom uh, in general, we, we name, we call, we say that this is a filter based uh, mm, sandboxing, which means that we are defining some filters and every application can have a different filters and so on. In Capsicum, the thing is a little bit different. So at the beginning, we have a very tight sandboxing. We use only one syscall called CapEnter to enter this uh, capability mode or sandbox. Uh, in Capsicum, we, uh, we call the capability mode the the state of the application in which we are, when we are in sandbox. So when we in, enter the capability mode, we, we can do that using only one single Cisco. And uh, this means that we don't have access to any global namespaces. We can't open any files. We can't manage our jails. We cannot list process. We can't really change the clock settings and so on and so on. All the global namespaces in Capsicum, access to global namespaces is, is denied. So in Capsicum, we are managing our rights using capabilities. And when the Capsicum was designed, we must figure out what will be the best thing for those capabilities. 
those capabilities should represent many things in our ads because uh, we want to have some uh, access to our files, we want to have access to network and so on and so on. We would like to be able to duplicate our capability and maybe send it to other process uh, and uh, to share them with other process. So if one process has access to some resources, we want to be able to delegate the re this access to those resources to other process. And finally, we would be able to remove those capabilities from, from the process. So if we will would done, we are finished working with some capabilities, for example, with some file, we'd be able to, to remove those capabilities from, from our program. It turns out that in operating systems, we have something called descriptors. And those descriptors are uh, handles to almost everything. Almost everything in the operating system is represented by descriptors, sockets, uh, files. Um, you can have a uh, descriptor to, file, uh, to directory. Uh, we also, during the work on Capsicum, we also added a process descriptor. So you also can have a handler to, um, to process. Uh, they can be duplicated. We have a very nice interface called DAP. Uh, and we can duplicate this uh, interface, uh, this uh, handler. Uh, we can send them to different uh, processes using dom Unix domain sockets. Uh, and finally, we can revoke access to those cap to this file to this, uh, handler by just closing the descriptors to it. So in Capsicum, like I mentioned, you don't have access to any global namespaces. So all the allowed syscalls are basically the ones which are operating on those descriptors. So like you, uh, if you would go to syscarncapabilities.com, there is a file which describes all the, um, all the uh, syscalls that are allowed in Capsicum. So as we can see here, uh, for example, we have open ed, which means that we can open files in Capsicum, but only if we have a descriptors, a descriptor to the directory. We can, for example, kill a process, but only if we have a descriptor, process descriptor, to uh, to um, to the process that we want to kill. So instead of filtering the syscalls, because basically all the processes that enter the capability mode has access to all the same syscalls. The difference is that, do they have handlers? Do they have the descriptors to the, to the resource that they want to use? And going even further, uh, Capsicum introduced a capability rights, which means that we can limit the descriptors itself even further. So, there are like 50, around 50 different capability rights. And uh, we can say that on this particular descriptor, we can only read data. Or on this particular uh, descriptor, we can only write to this, uh, to this particular uh, descriptor. Uh, the very nice feature of Capsicum is, uh, and Capsicum writes is uh, that, we can, uh, that we can say that the descriptor is up and only. So we can only write additional data to uh, this descriptor. Uh, it's, it may be very useful, for example, in an um, application that is uh, logging some critical um, data. And uh, for example, in our company, we have one process that is accepting a lot of data from the network. And this very interesting target for attacker to exploit that. And all the packages that are transmitted to this process are also dumped to the file. And the descriptor, which is used to dump the data from, uh, from this process, is using this uh, capability, this, uh, this right to up and only, which means if somebody would exploit this process, he could not jump and override the logs uh, of our file. So even if the process would be exploited itself, 
we would have a package, we would have an uh, information about the exploitation in our log files. So this is very useful and very interesting features that, that we get uh, with the Capsicum. So like I said, uh, we can't access any global namespaces in Capsicum in capability mode. So how we can really gain some capabilities. So there are two main uh, ways of doing that. First is the initialization phase, which means that we open all the, um, all the resources that we need to use in our application before entering the capability mode. So before entering the capability mode, we entered some, uh, we uh, open some files, and then we are working on those files after uh, after uh, entering the ca uh, capability mode. This is very useful uh, for very simple programs like WC, for example, or, or, or maybe CAD, which we will see later, uh, that we will just move all the, uh, all the opens, all the, uh, all the uh, uh, not allowed operation, which are kind of secure because opening file is not something that you have to be afraid, but parsing the file will be done after entering the, entering the capability mode in the, in the zone that is secure. And if somebody, if there will be uh, some issue, some bug in our code, then attacker won't gain access to additional data. He would have access only to the, um, to the, um, the, to the capabilities that the program had during the uh, during the uh, enter to the to the uh, sandbox, um, or uh, we can, for example, open some directory and work only in particular directory. And if we would find if somebody would find some bugs would exploit our program, he maybe can only read this particular uh, directory, but he can't write to it. He cannot create files, and most important, he cannot create socket and send our data. Um, to some servers. Um, another way to gain some access is by delegation. So like I said, the, what we wanted from capabilities and what we can achieve using descriptors is that we can delegate from one process to another process. So if some privileged process have, have uh, some uh, access to some resources. For example, he have some open uh, descriptor, we can pass to the sandboxed process and, um, and allow this sandboxed process to do the most complicated stuff. So this idea uh, of delegations and creating uh, those um, privilege process is something that, uh, that we consider creating Casper. So Casper is our library, which allow us to uh, deduplicate our code in way that, uh, deduplicate our code in way that we have some privilege process that can do some stuff for our unprivileged process. It's done by very convenient API, which I will show you in a moment. So it's very, uh, very um, similar to the functions that it's uh, which Casper is replacing. It's um, so in case of the delegations, we uh, we have one process which is unprivileged, and then we need to implement the uh, inter-process communication between privileged and unprivileged process. We need to uh, think about the limitations of this process and so on and so on. All of that is hide inside the Casper that the sandboxing is done much, much easier. And the only caveat of Casper is that we have to create Casper before entering capability mode. This is something that we have to remember because otherwise the Casper processes will also be in capability mode, so they cannot be uh, really uh, privileged ones. They will be limited like our process. So how Casper works? We have our unprivileged process. We are calling cap init to create Casper. During that is also, the, there is created also additional uh, lightweight process called Zygote which is basically our source of uh, process that will be created off. 
So next time that we will want to create some privilege process, it will be created from Zygote. Then we can open some services. The services uh, in Casper are the privileged process that, that serves us some uh, functionality, which are not uh, available in Capsicum. After that, the service is passed back to the process. All of this communication is done by the Unix domain sockets. And finally, we can close the connection to the Casper, and our process is, uh, can communicate with the service directly. And no additional services can be created because the connection to the Casper is closed. So, in uh, FreeBSD, we have uh, many different uh, services. Uh, we have a service for syslog, we have a service for sysctl, and two very interesting ones, system.net and pyarcs, which we will be talking a little bit uh, further. Always when I'm looking at the Casper and the Capsicum, I see a familiar picture to the microkernels when we are having very small programs, very small uh, libraries that are doing some work for other processes and passing the data back to the, to the main process. And exactly uh, it's with the Casper. We can have a FileArcs or dot, uh, .NET service or CCTL service, which are doing something for, for our process. And the main process, the, the process which are uh, doing something uh, something um, complicated don't have to uh, do, doesn't need to have access to those uh, to those uh, namespaces so uh, besides those uh, implemented uh, services we also have a uh, plan to implement a different, uh, different services for Casper. So one of them, for example, may be a TLS service, which would uh, be used to establish the uh, TLS connection for our process. The TLS uh, itself is very complicated. If you have looked into the OpenSSL um, implementation, it's horrible. I, I really... Uh, it's very, very uh, terrible and very complicated. And we can, for example, have additional Casper service, uh, maybe even sandboxed, which would do all the complicated handshake uh, and so on and so on, and only pass the data back to our process. And in this case, when, for example, uh, we would find another hard bleed or any other vulnerability in, uh, in OpenSSL implementation, it will be very, limited it won't uh, allow to exploit all our uh, application another interesting idea is to create a service with the configuration with unified configuration for all our application we will serve our uh, applications configuration so we would have one service which can read the config files and in a unified way provide that configuration to to our application uh, add additional service that we are missing, and this is some idea that maybe you would be interested in implementing, is a service that allows us to manage jails. So, like I mentioned in Cap Capsicum, we don't have access to a jail namespace, so this is something that also would need to be uh, delegated. So let's try to sandbox something. Um, very interesting. Uh, program to sandbox is BS patch. Uh, the, the original patch for, for BS uh, patch uh, was done by Alan Jude. Uh, he was motivated because he saw two uh, kind of simple mistakes in BS patch. Uh, in, one, uh, in one the uh, CVE, uh, in one bug, the BS patch didn't check for the negative value, which allows to exploit it. And, uh, uh, in another bug, which was the um, fix for the previous one, there was an int integer overflow, which also allowed to uh, exploit our program. So Alan decided uh, to look into the BS patch and see how would be how complicated would it be to sandbox. So before we will go into the sandboxing, 
we really need to read the code. We need have to understand what our application is doing. And uh, this may be time consuming, especially if the application is using some external libraries that we don't know uh, what are doing. Otherwise, when we will close the application in sandbox, and this doesn't really matter in which sandbox, is it in seccom or in capsicum or any other uh, sandboxing technique, if we would close it, it can create even less secure application. Here is my, uh, I, I really like this example, when we will try to get some random data. And to do this, we will try to open the random device. But when it, it won't be uh, available for us, we will just return the, the, some random data uh, in not secure way. And um, this, um, this may be, uh, this can be a problem because su such error can go uh, unnoticeable for a long, long time. And maybe we um, sandbox it, our application. Maybe when somebody would exploit our uh, application, won't have access to all our data. But for example, if we would use this function to generate SSH key, this wouldn't be very uh, secure. So, like I said, we need to read and understand the code. So, first of all, BS patch is opening a couple of files here and there. Um, and to sandbox uh, BS patch, we will use the initialization phase uh, approach in which we will move all the opens from our uh, application to the uh, to the beginning of our file uh, in BS patch the opens was uh, split across the application in different files and so on and so on we want to do this before doing uh, actual patch so we are we are moving all those opens in our uh, in our application at the beginning of the uh, of it and at this point, we can basically put cap enter uh, after all those open and our uh, application sandbox. That's all we really need to do for this uh, BS patch application. It wasn't very hard, but we can go even further. Uh, we can read more code and see what, how our descriptors, those files are used. So for example, here we are reading uh, some data from from one descriptors and here we are jumping into the in files uh, in the different uh, in the different uh, on on the different descriptor so we can limit our our, our uh, descriptors even further and we can set the right capability rights to those descriptors in this case we are using capread and capseek to limit those descriptors even further. This is something really additional work because uh, at this point, uh, our, our uh, BS patch was sandboxed, was very secure, but we can go even further. Um, with Capsicum, we also introduced thing called Capsicum helpers, which allows us to deduplicate um, code. There are some uh, operations in Capsicum that you want to do uh, in every application. For example, limit some streams. This is something that you will do on every, basically on every, every application. So we can, we have a, a special functions which uh, limits, they are setting up the right cap, uh, capability rights on the descriptors, the most common used ones uh, on uh, the, um, standard uh, standard uh, uh, IO uh, descriptors. Uh, we also can, uh, there are some caveats of uh, Capsicum so that you cannot open any arbitrary files on um, when you enter the capability mode. So we also have additional two functions, cache cut pages and cache TZ data, which allows you to uh, pre-cache the files that can be used later. Cut pages is basically the, um, an, an 
native language support uh, files so that when you are printing errors, you have uh, errors in your native language. And those files have to be uh, pre-opened before entering the, the capability mode. And TC data allows us to cache the times and uh, files uh, before uh, entering the capability mode. We also have a CAPH Enter and CAPH Enter Casper, um, which we can also see in BS patch that we originally use CAP Enter, and we also check the kernel of this CAP Enter. So when we uh, on when we enter the uh, capability mode, in most cases it, it failed. That this means that we don't want to continue. Uh, but in case when the analysis was returned, it means that our system was built without Capsicum support. Uh, I don't know why people would do that, but you can uh, compile FreeBSD kernel without Capsicum support. Uh, and uh, in this case, we don't uh, we don't want uh, user to not be able to use his uh, programs. So, in case that the syscall is not uh, allowed, we uh, we just uh, we just continue without it. So this code can be uh, replaced with the cap h enter, which hides from the uh, developer uh, need for checking the error by him. So, like I mentioned, one of the uh, challenge in uh, Capsicum in capability is uh, the need to access some files. And we have a Casper um, service called FileArcs, which allows us to um, delegate to Casper opening files for us. Uh, the API is very simple. We just pass the argc and argv of our program or any really list of files that we want to, to open, we define the flags for these files uh, and the, the, the normal flags like you are doing this for the open syscall and also you are able to limit them already uh, to the capability uh, rights, setting the, uh, the, which capability rights should be set on, on those file descriptors. Mm. This, uh, this service allows us to open the files already being in the capability mode. This is done like I mentioned, like I showed you before how Casper is doing. We have a privilege process which can access our file system. He's opening some files for us that we are requesting through open and passing back the file descriptors to us. <clears throat> so let's try it. Um, here we have an example with the WC, which is a program which uh, allows us to count the, uh, uh, the lines uh, or bytes uh, of in the file. And uh, in, we again split our program uh, through, uh, to the initialization phase and the, the, the main phase, the, the, the more, more complicated phase. And in the initialization phase, we are creating a connection to the Casper using FileRx init. This is also high from us. We can use FileRx init C, which uh, accept the uh, direct connection to Casper. But when we use FileRx init, it will just create uh, all the services, all the magic will happen in this function. So this, uh, for, for simpler programs like WC, this simplifies the process. And then we are re uh, reading the NLS data, then uh, native language support data. Uh, we can also uh, limit our uh, uh, IO descriptors. This is done by CAPH, uh, K K K CAPH uh, limit instead the IO. And then we are using CAPH enter with Casper. This uh, functions uh, enters the capability mode and run the, uh, the um, uh, the uh, cap enter for us, but also is checking if the Casper was available. If not, then we will uh, exit the, the program. And with those few lines, the only last thing we really have to do is to change the open syscall to file arcs open. And this is really all that we have to do to um, sandbox WC.
and wasn't also very hard. This patch was a little bit more complicated because we moved all the uh, all the files opening in the initialization phase. In this case, we delegate this uh, opens to uh, to Casper itself. So uh, another uh, thing that is uh, challenging in in uh, Capsicum is accessing the uh, network. Uh, again, we don't have access to any namespace. We cannot create arbitrary connection to uh, to servers to uh, when we enter the capability mode. So we also have a service called CapNet, which allow us to create uh, service Casper service, which we can delegate the um, creating the sockets to. Uh, the service is very interesting because it's allow us to very precisely limit its needs. So we can say uh, to which exactly service we want to connect. We can uh, say which uh, DNS names should be uh, resolved uh, and even which family should be used. So uh, with this service, we even give additional uh, protection to our application by, by limiting uh, the application to very precise uh, domains that we want to, uh, to use. A very interesting uh, mode in which uh, the service can, can work is uh, connect DNS. Which means that we don't we don't define to which uh, servers we want to connect to, but we define only the uh, DNS names that we can resolve. And when Casper will list resolve those names, uh, the IP addresses of those uh, of those um, names will be added to the whitelist. So this uh, allows us very easy to define uh, which service uh, to which services we want to connect. For example, if we would like to connect to FreeBSD Foundation's um, website, we can define that uh, you can resolve only freebsdfoundation.com and uh, uh, we want to connect to DNS. And in this case, when the uh, when we resolve in our application in any phase, we will use, for example, get other info, which is function which we use for uh, resolving the DNS name, the, uh, the service will know that you should be allowed to connect to this, uh, to this IP address. So uh, get, going back to our horror story, uh, to the CAT program. Uh, before this presentation, I noticed that the CAT is not sandboxed uh, in FreeBSD. So uh, just one hour before this presentation, I decided to do something uh, with, uh, with that and look into the uh, code, how, how complicated it would be to, to sandbox CAT. And it turns out that it, won't, it wouldn't be very complicated at all. So first of all, Again, we are using FileArcs, uh, FileArcs uh, service. Uh, so we pass all the remaining arguments of CAT to our service. So the FileArcs will serve as uh, new files each time that uh, CAT will um, request for. And uh, again, we are uh, caching the NLS data and we're entering the capability mode. We know that from the previous examples. And we are changing the file arcs, uh, the, the open to file arcs open. And that's almost everything that we really have to do. But uh, it turns out that CAT is a little bit more complicated program than I was thinking. It's not only opening files and reading the data, but it also supports the uh, Unix domain socket. So you can connect to Unix domain socket using uh, a CAT. So we don't. Uh, we uh, not only need a file arc service, but we also need a network service. So uh, we need to define additional function, which will create us a connection to the uh, network service. We are again limiting to the resolving the names and we are agreeing that everything that was resolved can be, uh, that we can connect to. 
And simple as that, we just uh, change the get other info and uh, uh, get other info and connect to to the capability ones. And that's all we really have to do. Uh, I didn't commit that yet, but I have to do some more uh, more testing. But it's looking very uh, very easy to do. So thanks to those few lines of changes, uh, we uh, sandboxed our CAT application. So Capsicum also comes with a lot of different debugging infrastructures. Uh, sandboxing is a very challenging task, and uh, we have to read a lot of code. We have to understand a lot of uh, code um, of the application, but also from, uh, uh, of the libraries that we uh, we are using in our applications. Like I'll show you with the get random, maybe we are using some um, obsolete function, obsolete library, uh, which use uh, such function for, for uh, get random. So we need to read a lot of code. We need to understand a lot of code. And sometimes it's very hard. And Capsicum comes with a lot of debugging infrastructure, which also uh, helps us to um, on the development phase. One of those um, techniques is using catrace. So uh, when you are trying to um, sandbox application, you can run it uh, on the catrace. Uh, it will show you which syscalls was succeeded, what was not succeeded in. For example, in case of our uh, get random uh, and opening the, the random uh, device, uh, it would show us that some open was uh, was not allowed in capability mode. Uh, unfortunately, it's very easy to miss something because you need to grab uh, the, the uh, KDAMP output and look for the data for the errors um, in that in the dump. And it's also hard to cover all code paths because it's maybe some code paths are, uh, paths are only used when a particular uh, arguments are passed to our application. In that case, uh, we also need to have a, a very, um, uh, ext uh, very big uh, test suite that covers many different cases. If not, then we have to read the code or do a lot of testing manually by ourselves. So this is an example of our uh, get random. And uh, when we was trying to do open, uh, it was translated to open app. This is uh, something that um, very common for those days. And we was not uh, able to uh, do open uh, because we enter it already into the capability mode. So this syscall was not uh, not uh, allowed. Uh, the syscall can be uh, can be um, denied because from two two reasons. One can be that uh, we don't have capability to it. So for example, if we are trying to open some file uh, and we are using uh, relative or absolute path and we are not using uh, a um, uh, directory descriptors to open it. It means that uh, in this case that the uh, um, syscall can be denied or when we don't have right permissions on, on those des descriptors. Another uh, very interesting uh, facility which we can use to, um, to test our applications is uh, setting the sysctl current trap in opcap uh, to uh, setting this, uh, this uh, CCTL will uh, send, uh, kernel will send the um, signal to our application each time that, that something uh, was happening in capability mode that was not allowed in. Uh, this allows us to, uh, to uh, this uh, creates us a core dump so we can uh, analyze the, the um, uh, the core dump under the GDB or LDB or any other debugger that you that you like. Um, it's very hard to miss something uh, because we don't need to grab anything. Our application will just die, so you will notice uh, that something is wrong. Uh, but it still have the same uh, issue that uh, like the previous technique that it's uh, hard to cover all code paths. It's very hard to find all the options, all the uh, 
perform all the tests on the application itself. Um, here uh, we have an, uh, our program with uh, get random program which crash on the open ad again uh, and we can see uh, the backtrace of this program and we can dig uh, a little bit further and see in with what parameters was used with the open and maybe what uh, file descriptors was used and maybe uh, we was missing some some capability right all of those information can be uh, gather from from this program uh, another interesting uh, tool which can be used during the uh, sandboxing is called prodstat uh, if we will call prodstat with the um, f options it will show us all the uh, descriptors uh, opened by the uh, by the process and we also can see what capabilities was uh, are set on the the descriptors so in this case, we are uh, using, uh, we are um, investigating the DH client. Uh, DH client is already uh, capsicumized, and we can see that it has only three descriptors, uh, which uh, are for the um, uh, for. Uh, for the um, standard input, output, and error, and all of them are redirected to def null, and uh, those the capabilities set on those descriptors are read only, uh, read, write, uh, and some others. Um, so uh, in FreeBSD, we have over 100 applications that are already sandboxed. That was something that we are missing. I hope that we will uh, we'll add that in futures. There are some examples here. Uh, very interesting applications, uh, which are sandbox are, for example, SSHD, which uh, is very uh, mature and very large applications. But also, for uh, we have uh, Beehive. With very simple changes, we was able to capsicumize uh, Beehive, the, hyper, the FreeBSD hypervisor. So uh, it's not so hard to use Capsicum, which you can see. Uh, some things um, may be uh, a little bit uh, challenging, uh, but, um, but it's doable. Um, the thing that I didn't mention and uh, which uh, we are working with my uh, colleagues from the Memorial University is um, CapExec. You can look up the uh, paper that we uh, wrote about that. It's basically, sorry, it's basically the idea of, um, uh, of uh, changing the applications uh, the, the replacing, the interposition, the uh, syscalls that are not allowed in capability mode uh, without really changing the application itself. So during this research, we are working on um, basically running the application with any, without any modifications in the, in the Capsicum sandbox and delegating uh, all the uh, um, unallowed uh, syscalls to Casper's services. So, um, short summary about the Capsicum. Uh, things that I would really like you to remember. One of the things is that you enter uh, Capsicum with the single uh, syscall uh, called CapEnter. After that, all access to global namespaces are not allowed. Um, you can also use capability rights, so you can limit the, the, your file descriptions even further. If you would like to sandbox a little bit more complicated application, or you um, don't want to cache all the uh, files before in the initialization phase, or you cannot just open uh, some uh, connection to the server because you basically don't know where you want to connect yet. Uh, you can use Sleep Casper for that. And there is a lot of uh, documentation around uh, Leap Casper uh, on the man pages on FreeBSD. And I hope that uh, we will reduce the ambient authority, that less application will have access to everything in our system. There will be uh, very set permissions 
uh, of uh, for every application that we can really uh, which application can really do so that's all from me thank you very much uh, and maybe there are some questions about capsicum yep we do have a couple questions i'm going to actually paste them in the chat channel here as well so you can see them here's the first one um, what do you think is the best path forward for oblivious capsicumization? <laughs> we have many interfaces which require file system namespace access, access law, TZ set, et cetera. Modifying these interfaces to take capabilities as input is a lot of work and will never be finished. So, uh, like I mentioned, uh, we uh, we are working about the um, with my colleagues from 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 Memorial University who also are researching automatically replacing the um, the um, syscalls that are not allowed uh, in capability mode. Um, I will just turn off the presentation uh, and screen sharing that I see the question. Sorry about that. And you should see me now in full screen. Uh, and I will open the chat. So uh, some things uh, can be uh, pre-opened, uh, and uh, this is something that we see. Uh, for example, uh, TZ uh, data can be uh, read before entering the capability mode. Uh, some uh, some uh, things uh, can be delegated, uh, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, this is something that we have to work still on, and. Uh, Sometimes maybe we also need to change libc to behave a little bit in different way. So uh, it's it is a lot of work, but thanks to that uh, we also gain um, very tight sandboxing. In case of, for example, seccom, I didn't mention that uh, before, but in case of uh, seccom, if you will have some. Uh, set of rights for example you can open arbitrary files and uh, you can uh, open arbitrary uh, connections uh, to the internet this basically means that you don't have any sandboxing because you can read arbitrary data and send them over the application so you have to be very close uh, uh, you will have to be very careful which uh, syscalls are allowed and which are not uh, in case of the capsicum uh, we are building the whole ecosystem in the way that it's hard to make mistakes. Uh, it's hard to, uh, after the entering the capability mode, it's hard to do something fishy. You have some interfaces like with the Casper and so on, which allow you some access to the to the uh, to the namespace. But we are encourage you very uh, very strongly to. Uh, to limit those uh, access even further. So for example, if you are having, uh, in the CAT example, if you're having networking and uh, file uh, uh, file systems namespace access, you can only open local uh, sockets and you can only uh, read the data from the set rules. So there are also obviously some caveats of uh, Capsicum, but uh, we are working on that and yeah, if you are interested in joining us and, and helping with that, it will be very, very appreciated. Okay, uh, and one more question over here as well. Um, it is, when converting existing programs to support Capsicum, are there any structures or designs that make programs hard to convert? I particularly like to know about programs that frequently modify paths. So in general, there are programs. Uh, in general, it's much easier to design application with the capability uh, approach uh, in mind. Uh, unfortunately, there are applications which are doing some uh, weird stuff with with uh, with files, uh, which is which is. Um, which sometimes uh, sometimes we end up with rewriting the application with the different approach. Uh, if you're in, uh, with the modifying the paths, you mean uh, about the creating the new uh, directories, or you mean uh, having uh, some um, 
I'm, I'm not sure I, I uh, follow really your uh, your question because um, in general, if you have a script or file description to the directory, you can do whatever you want in this particular directory. You can create files, you can open the files, you can uh, do whatever you want if you have capabilities to that uh, uh, to this um, directory. So uh, managing the, the the paths itself, it's not very hard. Uh, if you want to open arbitrary files or you want to open a, a lot of files from different directories, now there are two approaches. One is to pre-open all the files, which is something kind of complicated. You are limited by the, sorry, you are limited by the operating system, how many uh, file descriptors you can open and so on and so on. This is something that uh, FileArc is very useful. Uh, you just, like I shown on the slides, you just, uh, open, uh, you just uh, pass uh, the arguments, the, the, the list of the files you want to uh, open to file arcs and then replace the uh, opened with the file arcs and that's all you have to do really. So if you want to clarify more then, uh, or you have any particular idea uh, in mind then just please clarify. Okay, we'll, we'll wait a minute because the stream's a little behind. Uh, us to see if they have any other clarifications. Um, otherwise, that is our last question at the moment. Um, if folks have other questions, um, now is a good time to ask them. We'll just hang here for a second and see if anything else pops up. Okay. So far, no more questions. Um, so I think Deb, if you want to, there she is. <laughs> okay, we'll probably get some more now. Oh, um, that's usually what happens. <laughs> well, thank you for that talk. That was really interesting. I really didn't understand Capsicum before. Um, I feel like I understand a little bit more now. Uh, not that I do any <laughs> type of kernel programming. Um, so anyway, thank you so much for uh, thank spending Thank you for your invitation. It was very, uh... A pleasure to be here with you. Yeah, thank you. And it's and it's nice to see you too. It's been a long time. Yes, so, that's true. That's true. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, maybe, you know, I'm hoping you're a BSD con. So we'll see. Um, yeah. we'll see, see how next Unfor year goes. Unfortunately, COVID um, uh, complicate a lot of uh, our plans for this year. So I hope the next year will be much, uh, much better. We hope. We hope. So thank you again. And um, so next week we will have our last talk for the year. And uh, that will be an introduction to documentation by Sergio Carlovia. I'm not sure if I pronounce his last name right, but um, but anyway, he will be talking about documentation. And yes, you got that right. It will be in a week. So we changed up these uh, last two talks just a little bit. And um, so that'll be the last one for the year. You can always catch up on all of our talks um, on our website and um, everything's been recorded. And then we will start up again. We don't have the schedule yet, but we will be uh, starting up the talk series next year, uh, probably mid-month, probably mid to the end of the month to give us some time to put that together again. So anyway, so thank you and bye. See you in a week.